was bad today. I, I, I walked around. I, I freaking walked it. I went to my wife when I went to Sippy, and then I, we don't know salute. Sure. Yep. Well, I'll just have you come to the meeting when we set it up. I'll let you know what it is. Um, we all talk. We don't know what to do, but there's got to be something. There's move the bus, move that bus thing somewhere else. Well, that's a technique too. Good evening, everyone. I call the City Council Committee to the whole meeting for Wednesday, August 19th to order. Um, we've had the derecho and many other things, so a lot of people have struggled and they're suffering with power or relatives, the COVID. So please, a moment of silence for many things. Thank you. And I know Alderman Jobs is on the line, so I'll just lead the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Brian, if you'd be kind enough to please call the roll. Dunn. Here. Dorman. Here. McGinnis. Here. Lee. Here. Grip. Condon. Here. Peacock. Here. Dickman. Here. Jobgen. Here. And Ambrose. Here. Nine present, Your Honor. Thank you, Brian. So a little protocol and decorum. If you have your phone with you, please, um, I'd ask you to put it on silent or turn it off just so it doesn't interrupt. If you have to take a call, you please step outside. Um, we'll be respectful of you. Please be respectful of us. Please talk to us as a body or me. Uh, don't call out anybody individually. Uh, remember, we're talking to all our fellow Davenporters and Quad Cityans. Um, and you'll, when you come to the podium, if you'd like to speak on an agenda item and or uh, public at the end, uh, please give your name, address, or ward, or if it's not this city, another city. So I appreciate your respect, and we'll give you respect back. Thank you very much. Ms. Spiegel, City Administrator, any update, I'm sure? Actually, nothing this evening, Your Honor. Okie dokie. That calm, stable, and is good. <laughs> we have six public hearings tonight, a uh, few, one in community development and one in public works and a couple in finance. So uh, community development, Alderman Grips uh, out of town right now. So Alderwoman Lee will lead the public hearing in community development. Alderwoman Lee. Thank you. One public hearing for community development tonight. Um, the first public hearing is on the proposed con uh, is on the proposed conveyance of city-owned parcels H 3 at 1412 West 14th Street to Carey and Misha Davis petitioners, and A 60 21 at 1619 West Pleasant Street to Breland and Donald Dickerson, the petitioners. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this public hearing? Uh, anyone from the council? No. We don't address during oh, public hearings. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't follow the script. Okay. Seeing none, I move to close the hearing. Say All in no. favor? There we go. Thank you. Aye. Very good. The public hearing is closed. Okay, we'll move on to public works. Alderman Dunn will lead that public hearing. Alderman Dunn. Thank you, Your Honor. We have one public hearing for public works this evening. I open the public hearing on the resolution of necessity for the 2020 alley resurfacing program covering the north-south alley between Pershing Avenue and Iowa Street from East Columbia Avenue to East Garfield Street. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this public hearing? Seeing none, I move to close the public hearing. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. And this public hearing is closed. Back to you, Your Honor. Thank you. 
Um, next section is finance. We have four public hearings. Alderman Condon will leave those public hearings. Alderman Condon. Thank you, Your Honor. I open the public hearing. Uh, we have four pub, uh, public hearings this evening. So uh, I open the first public hearing authorizing the city to convey the city-owned parcel W0453-OLD to the owners of 3207 Fieldcrest Drive, the adjacent parcel to the northeast. Is there anyone from the public that would like to address this item? Seeing none, I move to close the public hearing. So moved. There's a second. motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Aye. This closes the public hearing. Uh, the second item, uh, second public hearing, is a public hearing authorizing the city to convey the city owned parcel X1101B06B to the owners of 927 West 60th Street the adjacent parcel to the north. Is there anyone from the public that would like to address this public hearing? Seeing none, I move to close the public hearing. Uh, motion and second. a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? I move, the, uh, it closes the public hearing. <laughs> <laughs> Item number, th uh, uh, public hearing number three is a public hearing authorizing the city to convey the city owned parcel F 0046-16 to Francisco Brown, petitioner and resident of 817 Farnham Street. Is there anyone from the public that would like to address? Seeing none, I move to close the public hearing. There's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. This closes the public hearing. Uh, and the fourth public hearing is a public hearing authorizing the city to convey the city-owned parcel G0038-36B located on the north side of the 300 block of West 9th Street to Lisa Avelia, petitioner, and the owner of 908 Harrison Street. Anyone from the public wishing to address this public hearing? Seeing none, I move to close the public hearing. Second. It's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. And that closes Aye. the public hearing and concludes the finance. Thank you, Alderman Condon. Next uh, item is petition communications from uh, council members and mayor. I just have a couple things. Uh, we uh, sent out to different organizations and we'll put on our website and we'll send it to whoever wants. Uh, website, uh, YouTube video, sorry, YouTube video. We're starting our police department recruiting um, and it goes to September 8th. So if you're interested, please find folks and uh, um, bring them to the workshops so they learn uh, the process. We also have three in-person workshops that, again, was sent out to a lot of organizations. But if you want, um, you can ask me or go to our website. The first one will be on Tuesday, August 25th at Third Missionary Baptist Church at 630. Uh, then we have one on Saturday, August 29th at 11 a.m. at the River's Edge. And then Thursday, September 3rd at 6 p.m. at Davenport Police. Uh, again, we have a video, and we're going to be uh, tracking and following, so um, just pay attention. And please, I ask the community to help find some folks that are interested, at least get them to the workshops to get more information and find out maybe uh, what it's like to be a police officer, because we, uh, we, are, we are wanting more folks in our community to be part of this process. Um, just so everybody knows, um, thanks to Mallory Merritt, and the HR department, uh, just so we're letting everybody aware, we're conducting um, police and bias and cultural diversity training uh, for 150 supervisors in September, and then we'll carry it to everybody else after that. Um, so Mally and her folks are putting that on, and we'll bring in someone from the outside on the second part. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, let's see what else I got. That's all for me. So uh, Alderwoman McGinnis. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, just a little bit of a census update tonight. Uh, um, so uh, as of today, um, we have uh, 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 the United States as a whole is, has increased. Iowa was kind of flat from last week, but um, Scott County and or Davenport, Scott County was flat, but Davenport has increased uh, the number of the returns. It's a self-response. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see over there in the in the in the corner. But I'll send this out to council. But we did have throughout the city in uh, various census tracts, we did have responses ranging from 0.1, and that's the average, to 0.3 uh, percent, uh, which is well above the national average. So people are responding. Um, again, we have about um, five weeks left. Um, uh, we have a shortened census window, as everybody knows. 
Um, if you are interested in, we have a few census signs, um, which uh, Alderman Dorman held up last week. Uh, we still have a few of those. If you're interested in putting them out in target areas, please let us know. Also, if uh, any of your neighborhoods are doing cleanups or organizations you work with are doing cleanups, we have sort of some census bling, including a lot of uh, uh, cups. If you're doing cleanup and you need cups for water or whatever, or if you need something, if you're willing to do something with your group to kind of encourage the census, um, get in touch with Samantha Torres. We do have items still, and we'd like to get those out. Um, it's everything from cups to post-it notes to chip clips. We have uh, uh, some uh, multilingual materials as well. So uh, we really would like to get these things out, and our goal is to try to get it out by the end of August. So please let us know, and you can contact uh, Samantha Torres in the um, council office. Um, I did notice um, an article came out today that there are, just, just put it out there for thought, that there are several cities suing at this point uh, because of the abrupt ending of the census. Um, it was to end October 31st. It's now ending September 30th. And there are lawsuits by several California cities. And I don't know how widespread that will become. Um, it was approved by one part of government and the, and the other did not move. And that caused the end date to change. So just put it out there. So food for thought. So thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Alderman McGinnis. Alderman Jobjian. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Just briefly, I wanted to announce that I will be uh, holding ward meeting next Tuesday. August 25th, 6.30 p.m. at Duck Creek Park Lodge. Um, I encourage everyone that attends to please don a mask inside, even though we'll be uh, spacing seats apart. Also, we will be sharing a link beginning of next week uh, to allow people to attend the meeting uh, virtually if they so choose. And I thank staff for helping arrange uh, not only the location, but uh, the link as well as uh, uh, setting up uh, NEPT offers are to come and speak about public safety. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Alderman Peacock. Thank you so very much. Um, Mary, you are, <laughs> when it comes to the census and updating everybody with, with what's truly important, the census is what's important. And, and if, like I told you before, if you speak before me, I was going to say thank you and not do my part. Um, I tell my friends and, and I put on my little Facebook page that we need to really support the, the census because it's very vital to get federal dollars back and bring it back to Davenport. Um, to the police chief and fire, uh, fire chief, public safety, I, I, I think I said it before, but I want to always reiterate that I am truly appreciative of what you guys did over the course of you know last week and to include this week because the cleanup and fire safety continues even after the debris is gone. Most people think it think the work, the hard work is done. No, it continues. And I just want to say hats off to them as well as Nicole and her team of uh, public works. You know, I get the email traffic on everybody complaining about uh, traffic, road signs, uh, debris pickup, but once again, you know, as a retired logistical officer, no one's understand it takes a logistical feat to do what Davenport has done. And my hats off to the great staff of Davenport. Um, I'm still trying to nail down when my next ward meeting will be, but it will be the, during the first or second week of September. And that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Alderman Peacock. Alderman Ambrose. Thank you, Your Honor. I was given a petition in support of our great police department and I was asked to pass it out to a uh, council and mayor. And it's uh, the silent majority in our community greatly support and appreciate our police department. And a lot of people are afraid to come down to the city council and express that for what's been going on in the past. But I want to reassure the police department and all the good people in Davenport uh, I think we realize there's a great number out there. They do support the police department and refuse to uh, accept the idea of defunding our police department and taking a, our police officers out of our great public school system. 
Thank you, Alderman Ambrose. Anyone else pausing? Alderwoman Lee. Would like to thank Public Works, Emergency Management, City Staff, Mayor. We've had a pretty tough week. Uh, everybody in Davenport and many other communities uh, in Iowa and throughout the Midwest. Um, one of the, uh, Secretary Chu, Department of Energy, once said um, that Thomas Edison would recognize our electrical grid if he were to see it today. <laughs> and um, so the fact that we uh, were able to get everything up and it only took a week with as massive a damage as we had was pretty amazing. And that we're continuing to clean up the debris. I would just like to thank everyone for everything we're doing. The other thing is I would just like to remind people that COVID is still alive and well in our community and um, increasing. And right now there is a apparent problem with the data. So there may be actually higher levels than what is being recorded. So I just want to remind people to please be safe, be respectful of each other, um, and take care of yourselves and your neighbors, your friends, your family. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alderman Lee. And then one other thing, I have an alibi. Uh, there is food assistance replacement available. Um, I know Alderman, Alderwoman Lee has been out in her ward walking around and others up here have also. So there's some websites and some information if you have folks that are interested or needing assistance, bo both in the individual assist assistance disaster grant or things like that, please get a hold of us and we can uh, point you in the right direction and get some help to you. Again, I will also add, as my colleagues have said so eloquently, Public Works and, and Mid-American and some of the folks out here, uh, we had so many uh, different organizations helping. Um, Monday afternoon, 300 some roads blocked here. Wednesday afternoon when the governor is here, we had them down to 20, so that's a, that's a Herculean effort. Um, so my hat's off to the work that uh, our folks here put in. So. Not seeing anyone else. Very good, we'll move on to the regular part of the agenda then. Uh, we have four areas for discussion, community development, public safety, public works, and finance. Um, the first area to be discussed is community development. Alderman Grips, usually the chair, he's not here. Alderman, Alderwoman Lee will lead that discussion assisted by Alderman Dunn, Alderwoman Lee. Thank you, let's see if I can do a better job this time. Uh, we have one item on the agenda this evening for community development. It's the resolution authorizing the mayor to execute documents necessary to convey city-owned parcels H0023-33, 1412 West 14th Street to Carrie and Misha Davis petitioners, and 0A0060-21, 1619 West Pleasant Street to Breolin and Donald Dickerson petitioner. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Is there anyone from the council? Ambrose. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, Alderman Ambrose. Thank you, Madam Chair. Tom, you know, for the public, you know, we do this quite often, but I'm sure a lot of people don't understand. Can you give a little history and why this happens? I'm not sure about the specifics of this particular case, but in general, but in general, the process for a uh, governmental entity like a city in Iowa to sell off excess property is to go through a two council cycle process. And one of them, they set up a public hearing. They also advertise that public hearing in the newspaper. And then we hold the public hearing as we did earlier. Uh, tonight, and then the council has to actually then approve the conveyance. So it's a process that's out there, so it's transparent to the public, and the public, if they so choose, can come and comment. Tom, explain what some of the excess property might be. Uh, lots of times they're, uh, they're vacant lots. Uh, sometimes they're properties that are community and economic development uh, program has used federal dollars to rehabilitate and restore. Mm -hmm. um, and that's most of what it is. Sometimes it's a, a excess right away, right away that was platted, but never used and never going to be used. All right, thanks Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Ambrose. I believe this one is under the Homestead Act, correct? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, and um, any other discussion? And, and thank you again for asking that good question. Um, I ask Alderman Dunn to please set the agenda. I make a motion to place this item on consent, please. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, it passes, and thank you. That concludes community development, Your Honor. Thank you, Alderman Lee. Next area for discussion is public safety. Alderman Ambrose will lead the discussion. Alderman Jobson will set the agenda. Alderman Ambrose. Thank you, Your Honor. The first item for discussion is a third consideration ordinance amending schedule 13 of chapter 10.96 entitled seven tongue truck restriction by adding 59th Street from Main Street to 61st Street. Anybody from the audience? Council? Number two is a resolution approving the following street lane and public grounds closures on the listed dates and times to hold outdoor events. The first one is Tim Dahlman Festival of Praise, LeClaire Park, 8 a.m. Friday, September 4th, 2020 to 11.30 p.m. Saturday, September 5th, 2020. Closure is Harrison Street and Ripley Street, south to River Drive. Anybody from the public? Council? And number two is Top Notch Production Incorporated, Quad City Bank and Trust, and Quad City Symphony Orchestra Riverfront Pops. LeClaire Park, 8 a.m. Thursday, September 10th, 2020, from 3 p.m. Sunday, September 13th, 2020. Closures, Harris Street and Ripley Street, south of River Drive. Anybody from the public? Council? Number three is a motion approving noise variance requested by various events and listed dates and time. The first one is Off Point Pub, Kevin Soap, Memorial Ride, 2025 Hickory Grove Road, Sunday, September 6, 2020, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., outdoor music over 50 dB. Anybody public? Council? Number two is Top Notch Productions Incorporated, Quad City Bank and Trust, Quad City Symphony Orchestra, Riverfront Pop. September 12, 2020, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Outdoor music over 50 dBA. Anybody from the public? Council? J&M Displays and Corporate Riverfront Pops Fireworks Show, LeClaire Park, Saturday, September 12, 2020, 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. Fireworks over 50 dBA. Anybody from the public? Council? And the last one is Jacob Harry Cruise in for a cause parking lot west of Modern Woodman Park Sunday, September 20th, 2020, 2 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Outdoor music over a 50 dB. Okay, motion approving the petition of alley lights at 211 South Pine Street. Get a motion to approve the light. Uh, that'll be voted on next week. Okay, thanks, Tom. Okay, next one is motion approving beer and liquor license. We don't go through those, but you can find them on the social media. And uh, Alderman Jones, can you hear me? I sure can. I make, I make a motion that we move all items to the consent agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Ambrose. Next area is public works. Um, that'll be discussed by Alderman Dunn and Alderman Dorman. Alderman Dunn. Thank you, Your Honor. We have 12 items on the public works agenda this evening. Item number one is the third consideration of the ordinance amending chapter 16.28.05 entitled Improvement Sewers of the Davenport Municipal Code by amending section 16.28.060, therefore relating to the city collecting compensation for televising services performed in the process of sanitary sewer acceptance. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Council. Seeing none, this item will move on. Item number two is a second consideration of an ordinance amending chapter 15.08.300 of the Davenport Municipal Code entitled Permits. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Council. Seeing none, this item will move on. Item number three is a second consideration of an ordinance amending chapter 15.16 of the Davenport Municipal Code entitled Electrical Code. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? 
Council. Seeing on this item, we'll move on. Item number four is the first consideration of an ordinance amended, amending chapter 13.38.100 entitled Construction Site Erosion and Sediment Control Enforcement of the Davenport Municipal Code to allow the City Council to set the schedule of fines by resolution. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Council? Seeing on this item, we'll move on. Item number five is a resolution of acceptance for the East 39th Street and Forest Road intersection reconstruction project completed by CDMI Concrete Contractors of Fort Byron, Illinois, with a final cost of $126,355.20. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Council? Seeing on this item, we'll move on. Item number six is a resolution of acceptance for the rehabilitation of the J.M. Morris Boulevard Pump Station 202 project. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Council? Seeing on this item, we'll move on. Item number seven is a resolution of acceptance for the Adler Theater Floor Replacement Project. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Council? Seeing on this item, we'll move on. Item number eight is a resolution awarding the contract for the C, B, and Q parking lot reconstruction project to Hawkeye Paving Corporation of Davenport and Bettendorf in the amount of $390,188.20. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Council? Seeing on this item, we'll move on. Item number nine is a resolution establishing the fee for a closed circuit television of newly constructed sanitary sewers prior to acceptance by the city. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Council? Seeing on this item, we'll move on. Item number 10 is a resolution setting the stormwater management maintenance and repair agreement recording fee at $100. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Council? Seeing on this item, we'll move on. Item number 11 is a resolution approving change order number one to the second and Marquette sewer improvement project with Miller trucking and excavating in the amount of $170,000. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Council? Seeing on this item, we'll move on. Item number 12 is a motion directing staff to hire an engineering firm for the design of the CDBG replace replacement project pending environmental approval from HUD. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Council, Alderman Ambrose. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do we have someone from staff to explain this for the public, please? Uh, Bruce Berger, Community and Economic Development. So this is, uh, these are funds that are um, being replenished into the CDBG account um, that the previous council had, had uh, directed staff to move those into infrastructure projects. So this is the first phase of that where we would be looking at a number of streets um, and getting the design and engineering work done for those so that um, you, can, you can look at those awards as they come in so that in theory, Clay can correct me on this. I believe the earliest the project would begin if everything would fall into place would be next construction cycle. And we have those streets? Uh, yeah, we do have those identified. Um, I think they're in your packet. Um, if not, we can get those to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you, Alderman Ambrose. Anyone else? Seeing none this item, we'll move on. And Alderman Dorman, would you set the agenda, please? I move to place all items on the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. And that concludes public works for this evening, Your Honor. Thank you, Alderman Dunn. Last area to be discussed is finance. Alderman Condon will lead to discussion. Alderman Peacock will set the agenda. Alderman Condon. Thank you, Your Honor. We have 11 items on the agenda this evening. The first item is a third consideration ordinance amending chapter 15.32 of the Davenport Municipal Code titled Uniform Fire Code to adopt the International Code Council's 2015 International Fire Code with amendments. Is there anyone from the public that would like to discuss this item? Anyone from council? Um, I'll just ask that Mr. Oswald and Fire Marshal Morrison continue to do a good job as 
people pull permits to make sure that um, they're well aware of this and we can hopefully get out ahead of any uh, people being caught unaware. Thanks. Um, item number two is a resolution authorizing the mayor to execute the necessary documents to convey city owned parcel W0453-OLD to the owners at 3207 Field Crest Drive and the adjacent parcel to the northeast. Anyone from the public that would like to address this item? Council? Uh, next item is a number three resolution authorizing the mayor to execute the necessary documents to convey city owned parcel X1101B06B to the owners of 927 West 60th Street, the adjacent parcel to the north. Anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Council? Item number four is a resolution authorizing the mayor to execute the necessary documents to convey city owned parcel F0046-16 to Francisco Brown petitioner and the resident of 817 Farnham Street. Anyone from the public? Council? Uh, item number five is a resolution authorizing the mayor to execute the necessary documents to convey city owned parcel G0038-36B located on the north side of the 300 block of West 9th Street to Lisa Avila, petitioner, the owner of 908 Harrison Street. Anyone from the public? Council? And item number six is a resolution accepting the 2020-2021 year one of three AmeriCorps program grant for the corporation for the national and community services in the amount of Four hundred ninety-eight thousand seven hundred eighty-three, in authorizing the finance director or designee to to sign the grant agreement to be managed and implemented by the Davenport Parks and Recreation Department. Is there anyone from the public that would like to address that item? Council, uh, Your Honor. I just want to put a quick plug in. I've seen a lot of kids from our school district and others take part in this, and it really helps them find some something to do. And it's a really good program. Helps us out. Helps them out. Uh, and they move on to a great and uh, better thing. So I just want to put a plug in for this program. Thank you. Thank you. Item number seven is a resolution establishing the date and time for trick or treat for Saturday, October 31st, 2020 from 4.30 to 7 p.m. Is there anyone from the public that would like to address that item? Anyone from council? Alderwoman Dickman? We are setting the date now, but um, as it gets closer, depending on what conditions are in the community, we will probably be encouraging people to continue practice social distancing, et cetera. Just, I know I've seen some people, you know, freaking out that we're already setting this, but it's, we'll, we'll take precautions and advise precautions if necessary as it moves forward. Thank you. I agree with all those precautions, but I'm going to be really sad sitting in my costume at home because I'm already working on it. Um, item number eight is a resolution authorizing a request for reimbursement for eligible costs related to the COVID-19 public health emergency from the Iowa, Iowa COVID-19 government relief fund. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Anyone from council? Alderman McGinnis. Thank you, um, Alderman Condon. If uh, someone could, from staff, could just explain what this is about. I know we're going to vote on it later, but if we could have a little overview of this. Mallory Merritt, Finance. Uh, yes, several weeks ago, the governor's office released uh, the disbursement plan uh, for the state of Iowa's CARES Act money. Uh, the way that this is working in the state of Iowa, uh, the governor's office established the government relief fund. Uh, this will be managed by RSM, uh, an auditing firm, uh, where municipalities can submit for reimbursement for many different eligible items uh, that were released as part of that plan. Uh, as a side note, we were selected to be one of the pilot cities uh, that could submit first and work through uh, the kind of troubleshoot that uh, with the auditing firm. So we were able to submit on Monday. Uh, the city's allocation that we could submit up to was 2.4 million. Our first submission that we have requested uh, was for 1.9 and we'll go back this fall uh, for the remainder of our allocation. And have you decided how, what areas you'll be putting that into or is that still under 
Um, is that something staff's still working on? Yeah, but that's, we're evaluating that right now. We're trying to see what losses, if any, that we had for the prior, for the, this past fiscal year and what losses we expect to have for this fiscal year. And I'm sorry, I failed to remark that this item will be voted later on the agenda. So if there's no one else, that item will move on. Um, item number nine is a resolution approving three assistance programs through the state COVID-19, uh, COVID CDBG-CV application process to assist with the impact of the pandemic on Davenport residents, city of Davenport petitioner. Anyone from the public wishing to address that item? Anyone from council? Item number 10, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Judith. Uh, I'm, uh, Thank you, Alderman, Alderman Lee. Lee. Go Would right ahead. Would someone ahead. come up and explain this one as well, please? Uh, Bruce Berger, Community and Economic Development. So um, this is uh, something we've been waiting on for some time. Uh, it was also part of the CARES Act um, back in March. Um, it authorized HUD to um, uh, provide extra funding through the state to entitlement communities, and Davenport is an entitlement community. And so um, there, there's a, a limited subset of what you can use CDBG funds on anyway, and then we've been waiting on some guidance as far as how you would draw down those funds, what you could use on them. Maybe they would offer some flexibility. That guidance just came out last week, um, and the state is trying to proactively kind of move this along, so they established the September 1st deadline, and you can apply as an entitlement community. We need to tell the state what we'd like to, how we'd like to use the funds. The state will review that. Um, and so, um, actually, I'm jumping ahead a little bit to the next, but the next item is uh, CBG funds as well that flow directly to the city not through the state. Um, we, we had been working on that for some time to do a small business uh, recovery resiliency type program. So sort of what we thought is we'd bring all of them together with the September 1st deadline to the state in mind with the three state programs being residential related homeless assistance, rent assistance, and mortgage assistance. So all of those are tied to um, the normal CDBG rules, which would be households at or below 80% of median family give you an idea of household of four is around $60,000 gross a year. Um, single person, I think, is around $42,000 um, a year gross. So folks who are at that limit or below households um, would be eligible for any of those sorts of assistance programs. The homeless assistance would likely flow like the normal program does now um, over the last four months, normal, um, <laughs> through COVID over the last four or five months. Um, with assistance going to um, basically hotel vouchers for those to try to deconcentrate, de uh, not have congregate shelter um, solutions for folks. So, so those are the three programs. We'll have some more detail to come out. I don't have a ton of detail for you now. We'll need to have an application once the state approves that. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get some more information out through our social media and other marketing tools. Bruce, how are we going to get information out to the people that will actually need this? So lots of different, Bobby, you know, with, really with four different, jump into the next one, with four different programs out there, um, each one will likely have a slightly different, well, they all have a different population. Um, we'll, we'll use every single method we can. Um, some of them will probably rely on getting information out maybe through the schools, some, some of it through our nonprofit partners, some of it through lenders, some of it through landlords. Um, the housing cluster is one. Um, that there, there are a lot of groups and, and ways that we'll try to filter that information out. We'll, we'll have a timetable for folks to apply. Likely we'll have a deadline for two or three of the programs. Um, so we'll make sure we market that through our social media platforms and those things, so. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Berger and Alderwoman Lee. Item number 10 is resolution approving the Small Business Resiliency Program with the CDBG CARES Act funding to provide financial relief to assist small businesses as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. City of Davenport petitioner. Anyone from the public that would like to address that item? And anyone from council? Alderwoman Lee. Thank you very much, Alderman, uh, Alderman Condom. Would somebody please come up from staff and explain this one as well?
Thank you. Bruce Berger, Community Economic Development again. So um, this is the one I was referring to. Um, this one will likely be for uh, small businesses. Right now we're thinking full-time equivalency of 50 employees um, or fewer. Um, again, we'd mark it in the same kinds of ways, the thought being here that businesses would have been in good standing and up and running as of March 1st before COVID, the CARES Act requires that um, the, the benefits go to folks who are negatively impacted, businesses that were negatively impacted. So um, we'll, we'll have an application process for that um, if, you, if you closed or lost revenue. Um, and then the types of things you can use these funds on that we're anticipating would likely be things like rent, mortgage payments, um, inventory, um, those sorts of things, as well as perhaps you need software to deal um, going forward in, in the COVID environment differently. So, so we fleshed that program a little bit out more fully in your, in your program. Still not written in stone. This one's not flowing through the state. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll, but we'll, we'll likely try to roll that out here as quickly as we can as well now that we have HUD guidance. So. Will, will there be like a one page information that we can get out to folks or put on our Facebook page? Or? Yeah, definitely. We'll work on that. But right now we're trying to kind of put together what the application looks like. Want to vet that with some of our partners. Um, and, and then, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely have some kind of maybe uh, different marketing tools you can use as you're at award meetings and those things too. So. Thank you, Mr. Berger. Thank you both once again. And our final item on uh, discussion item is a motion authorizing the payment to visit Quad Cities for fiscal year 21 tourism marketing services in the amount not to exceed $375,000. Is there anyone from the public that would like to address this item? Anyone from council? Um, below uh, that, we have five uh, purchases from 10,000 to 50,000. We don't read each of those out loud, but they're listed here on your agenda for your information. Um, I'll ask Alderman Peacock, would you please set the uh, finance agenda? I move to place all items on the consent agenda minus number eight, which will be voted later on the agenda. Second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? And that concludes finance, Your Honor. Thank you, Alderman McConnell, Alderman Peacock. Next item is we have one item under other ordinances, resolutions, and motions. It's on your agenda, but we do need a suspension of the rules to, to vote on that. So is there a motion to suspend the rules? There's a motion, Alderman Peacock. Second. Second, Alderman McGinnis. Brian, roll call to suspend the rules and vote. Ambrose? Lee? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Dorman? Yes. Dickman? Yes. Peacock? Yes. Jobjen? Yes. Condon? Yes. And done. Yes. Nine yeses, Your Honor. Very good. The rules are suspended, so we can take up this now. Resolution authorizing a request for reimbursement for eligible costs related to the COVID-19 public health emergency from the Iowa COVID-19 Government Relief Fund. Is there any public with discussion? Seeing none, is there any alder woman or alderman? Will they move the resolution? Moved by Ambrose, second by Peacock. Any discussion from anyone? Seeing none, Brian, roll call on this item. Job Jen? Yes. Dorman? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Ambrose? Dunn? Yes. Peacock? Yes. Lee? Yes. Dickman? Yes. Ann Condon? Yes. Uh, nine yeses, Your Honor. Very good. That resolution is adopted. Next item, is there any public with business? If you want to talk to us, you have five minutes. Please present your name, address, or ward. We'll be respectful. Please be respectful. Anyone from the public? Okay, hearing. Okay, ma'am. Yes, please. Elizabeth Van Camp, Ward 1. It'd be great if we could leave slavery in the past, wouldn't it? Teach our children of the atrocities that happened in our country were reflecting on how far we've come. But unfortunately, this isn't possible. Slavery in the Jim Crow era set black Americans far back and the repercussions have continued to trickle down through the generations. Any advancements black folks have made have been met with aggression in the forms of lynchings, land being stolen, arson, laws segregating them from others in society, and societal norms that make it possible, acceptable even, to discriminate against them. We have ensured as a nation that for every step forward they take, we set them back 10 steps. 
We created this mess, and now it's time we face it. If you don't live and breathe in a black body, you likely don't notice the ways black oppression still affects black folks today. You may view the concerns black citizens are bringing here as false, made up, or even radical. That doesn't mean their experiences and concerns aren't real and valid. If your experience in life is that of a white person, your view of the world will likely be very different from black people. As a white person living in a world designed for white people, you have advantages that people of color will likely don't have. You exist in a bubble of white privilege, as I do, which guarantees there are certain things you'll never have to endure, like being followed suspiciously in a store, facing housing or employment discrimination, being at higher risk for arrest and being killed by a cop, being called a racial slur, being hunted down and killed by people for taking a run. Having white privilege isn't an insult, it's a fact. And those of us who have it can and should use it to address the mistreatment, oppression, and overt racism black folks still face today. And, we, and who better to fight for black citizens in Davenport than you, our elected officials. You should be listening to and taking to heart black people's experiences. Stop policing what their experiences should be based on because of your view of the world. No one expects our mostly white council to just get it. But truly listening to the experiences of people like Alderman Peacock or any of the black folks that are here tonight would be a good and frankly very simple step to take. You should be using the facts and data we have that show black Americans in large part don't trust police departments and ask why and what can we do to fix that. Major overhauls are needed. You can also use the data that we have to make decisions on things like whether cops should be in schools. Spoiler, they shouldn't. And we have the voices and tools here to address the very real racism that exists in our town, instead of dismissing concerns and refusing to open our minds. The world and Davenport are not so small that your experience overrides that of your constituents, those who you all were elected to represent. We can't undo our nation's very racist past. We can't undo slavery. We can't undo the things that have trickled down through the generations, but we can change Davenport now. We can make it a more just and equitable town, and that starts with taking steps like not funding police in our schools and taking, considering the idea of defunding our police department. I know that that sounds like a crazy and radical step, but if you actually do the research to look at what defunding our police department means, it really means making our community stronger. It means it, investing in the things and the people who have the knowledge and the skills to solve problems that are often dumped on our police department. And it also means investing in more education and training for our police so that they can work with our community better and we can actually build trust instead of just doing things in hopes that people will start trusting police. And that's all I have on that subject, but I, I would also like to emphasize, I can't believe I'm having to ask this five months into a pandemic. Please, City Council, consider a masking mandate. This pandemic's not going anywhere as long as we continue to walk without protection. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else? Again, Tina Gilbraith, First Ward. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and to be here tonight. Um, I'll continue to come and persist until I feel that Davenport is what we say, which is a community that's diverse, inclusive, and safe. And I do want to talk about that word safe. We hear constantly as a city how important it is to fund our police department and how we need to fight crime, get illegal guns off the streets and put criminals in jail, but I am here to remind you that this city's definition of safe is not a definition that includes us all. It is not radical to want to ensure the safety of my children. It's not radical to want to plan a future, but there are too many of us here in Davenport who are having to work harder than ever before, and that's due to the mixed messaging that's coming from the city. Mr. Mayor, I'm asking, I'm asking that you please help your council and your constituents to understand the difference between truth and rhetoric. Black Lives Matter is not a slogan, it's a plea. Defund the police only supports divesting some funds from police departments and reallocating them to non-policing forms of public safety and community support like social services, housing, education, healthcare, and other community resources. It is not draining the police funding completely. Again, I remind you of how much we spend in Davenport on our policing and ask you to please take another look. It's not radical to want our community to do better. And as a citizen, it's my responsibility to hold you all accountable. But if I'm going to be called a name, then I'm proud to be radical. If it's radical, 
for me to call back the prevention of the release of information to the public from our police department, then I'll own that. I'm radical. As a city, we have a right to know facts and circumstances. And before I'm interrupted, let me just ask, what in the hell is going on with the Berisha Terrell case? This ecosystem, which has been put into place where safety depends on the criminalization of citizens, makes absolutely no sense. And it is not what you were all elected to do. The dysfunction that regularly takes place within this administration is clear as day and is consistently perpetuated in the form of rhetoric each week that I'm here. We can have our beliefs, we all have our beliefs, but there's a fundamental difference between biases and right and wrong. When the call for militarization of the police or more policing in schools is being used as a weapon against citizens, specifically black and brown citizens in this city, in this city you're perpetuating biases. There's so much data to back up what systematically affects people of color right here in Scott County and Davenport, and it's dumbfounding that our budget, our conduct, and our law enforcement completely ignore it. How am I to believe that as a mother, you care for my family? How is any family of color? Inciting a military style scope of enforcement on your people is a huge red flag, and it should be to everyone sitting in this chamber. It is my hope and prayer that you all think long and hard how you got here, who elected you, and how quickly your seat is up for reelection. I think that the people of Davenport have had enough of your divisiveness. Attacking the Civil Rights Commission and protecting an obviously biased police association does not spell out safety. In fact, for me, for my son, and other black and brown families here, it spells danger. It spells white supremacy. It spells failure. But you, as our elected officials, you have the opportunity to change that and to change it now. Otherwise, I can promise you that you haven't even begun to see my persistence. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hello. I'm Amber Bordello. Address or word, please. I live um, 21585 Utica Ridge Road. I know it's not a ward, it's out in the country, but still in Davenport. Um, I don't have a prepared, eloquent speech like these two women, but I did want to come up and speak today because I'm hearing a lot of lip service. You know, we, yes, we want to address racism. Yes, we want to have equality. We want to have a safe, stable community, but yet we don't do anything. We know that a lot of the laws in this country are what led to the um, inequality that we see today that led to the disenfranchisement of black and brown people. So it is up to us, to you, the government, to the leaders of this, both federal and city, to actively work towards correcting those laws that created the racist system that we live in today. Um, I recently read a statistic that black girls in Scott County, and this is from the ACLU, are nine times more likely to be arrested than their white counterpart. That's my daughter. When I was young, I was really naughty. I was loud, I talked in class, um, but guess what? I got detention a lot. I got detention a lot, but I never got arrested in class. I stole, I never got arrested. I got punished, I never got arrested. But my daughter might not face that same outcome that I did. I got detention, I was able to go to college, get my degrees, get my master's degree, she could end up being arrested. Statistics show that once a, a, a juvenile is um, involved in the criminal justice system under the age of 18, they are seven times more likely to be in jail or prison as an adult. As a mom, I want better for my child, not worse. Living in Davenport, my daughter has a worse outcome than what I did. Like, do you want that for her? Like, look at her, do you want that for her? Nine times more likely to be arrested than I was. Like, that's not okay. And what are we doing? What are we doing? What is the police department doing? What are you guys doing to make sure that my daughter doesn't have that outcome? That is, that is something that we need. We can't just have lip service. You guys formed a committee to address the SROs. We have the mayor and the police chief on that committee. We know where they stand. We have two parents. How many people of color? How many parents of color are on that committee? How many members of Black Lives Matter are on that committee? Is it an equal committee? Are there equal amount? supporting it, an equal amount against SROs, or is it a bias committee? We need to stop having just lip service and actually do something, because I don't feel safe raising my daughter in Davenport. And I don't feel like, I actually have 
the privilege to be able to send my daughter to um, a private school because I do not feel safe sending my daughter to a public school in Davenport. That's the city that you guys are running, a city where I don't feel safe for my daughter. So it's time to quit the lip service and actually get something done. Uh, we came to the mayor with a hate crime ordinance. Um, it was earlier this year before COVID, and um, I know that he brought that before you guys, before the city council, and I appreciate that. However, uh, a resolution was passed rather than an ordinance. A resolution has no power. We need that ordinance passed so that when hate crime happens, people can feel that they can report it and that there can actually be real punishment for these hate crimes. There's been a rise of hateful flyers, and hopefully all of you know about this in our community. Um, we need to have that ordinance passed. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hello. My name's Jody. I'm from First Ward, West Ender, lifelong. Um, I want to stand here, and before I'm judged by the people behind me, I have a biracial granddaughter and grandson. I've experienced what they've gone through walking out Walmart. And before you get to the door, be asked for your receipts. So don't judge me on what I'm going to say. But they go to school, and we need to have the protection, whether you agree with me or not, for an SRO that can be there should any child show up with a gun. An SRO has the ability to work that process. Teachers do not. They are not trained to unarm a child. They're not trained to take away a knife. They're not trained. They can't even get involved in um, a fight. And these children are there. They see the violence. Our teachers need to be protected too. And should that SRO be a detriment to a child, then let's address that. Let's, what can be done? Children need role models. What are the people doing to be a role model on these childs? There's big brothers and big sisters. There's a lot of kids out there that need attention. I don't disagree with that, but we still need to protect the teachers and the remaining other kids that go. We have a lot of kids that come from broken homes, see violence, they see drugs. I've experienced in, the, in my lifehood growing up, they need to have a safe haven going to the school districts and we need to keep the SROs. Thank you. Thank you, anyone else? Hearing and seeing no one. If you have someone else, please come. Thank you. Hi, um, this is Carrie D. Crane. I think I'm in the first ward by 2802. I'm not sure. But I just want to speak on um, not to discredit anyone else's experience, but as far as having police in school, I would like to offer an alternative when you guys are planning this. Um, why do kids shoot up schools? broken homes, mental illness, I would encourage you guys to consider putting money and funding there, making sure kids have outreach programs, being more proactive than reactive with the cops. Um, statistics show in facts, data, they don't lie. Our people of color, and especially black students, are gonna be more at risk. So just wanted to throw out there, consider funding in mental health services and outreach programs. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi. Uh, my name is Kelly Cruz. I live in Rock Island, Illinois. Um, I'm the current chair of Quad Cities DSA. Um, I just wanted to quick address something that uh, Jody said that, um, and it's, it was interesting to me to hear a few, few meetings ago that we've had uh, SROs in Davenport since the 1980s. Um, most, most people did it after Columbine. But, um, you know, when people say, do we need cops in schools to keep uh, our kids safe? Um, there was a Washington Post analysis in 2018 of nearly 200 incidents of gun violence, and they found only two times where an officer successfully intervened in a shooting. And even in those cases, they were not able to prevent the shooting. Um, and um, as uh, Amber touched on before, schools with police see a 400% increase in students getting arrested. 
often for things that would have been a minor disciplinary issue or a visit to the school counselor in previous years with students of color and with disabilities disproportionately affected. So um, I think that I can understand, you know, I'm old enough that I, I remember Columbine. I was an adult already when that happened. I can understand the impulse to want to, oh, we got to have, you know, um, people with guns to protect the kids and protect the teachers because somebody's going to shoot up the school. But we, it's been over 20 years since we did that and over 40, in, you know, in this case here. And it doesn't work, you know, and that's kind of what my, you know, I don't have a kid that goes to the Davenport schools, but um, I don't want to see people making decisions, you know, leaders making decisions on the basis of what they think is a good idea or what they thought was a good idea or somebody thought was a good idea 20 or 30 or 40 years ago or what their gut tells them when there's data out there and we can actually, you know, look and see if this is the case. Um, I hear a lot of people saying, oh, well, officer so-and-so is such a great guy. You know, this isn't about these people as individuals. Nobody's saying, oh, well, this, you know, this particular cop is a jerk. Let's get rid of them. Um, they're, they're being asked, you know, which is, you know, kind of a recurring theme to do things that are not really in their job description. In fact, somebody even said at the last meeting I was here um, that, oh, we might um, have more um, women and people of color go into law enforcement because there are SROs that, you know, have contact with the kids and whatever, and they might be inspired. Well, this isn't a, like a job training program or, it's, you know, it's not like it's supposed to be like having soldiers in the schools, you know, army recruiters and stuff like that. That's not what it's for. So I would just encourage, you know, a little bit more um, rigor. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's what I've been, you know, in various government organizations myself, um, most of my adult life too. And, I, and it, evaluation is everything. If you can't evaluate it, you can't measure it. You don't know what it's doing or not. And, you know, that's, yeah, I've been hearing that since I was in my early 20s. Um, you know, it's great, you know, to, that, that people have this, this desire to help these kids and whatever, to protect kids, whatever. That's all great. But is it working? We're spending $28 million on the police department. I don't know how much of that goes to the SRO program. I hear there's a grant of some kind. Um, and I just wanted to quickly say um, also... A lot of the issues that I hear about when I come to these meetings don't affect me personally because a river and a state line separates me from you. But what I consistently don't like and what I think can be kind of like a, you know, a stain or a cancer that can reach everything is how some people are treated when they come to tell you that, you know, that Mr. Mayor or Alderman, whoever, that this isn't working whether it's this issue or, you know, somebody that is upset that there are Nazi flyers on their newspaper or whatever it is. Um, you know, and it, think about the moment that we're in in this country's history right now. You know, we gotta be, you know, when I was at a meeting last year where, you know, people just kept coming and coming because there was a, there was a really um, um, contentious issue up for, up for vote. And then, you know, all these people talked, most of them white, just because it's Iowa. And then um, an older black person that has been coming to these meetings a lot, because I've seen him, came up to, he, he was about to talk, and you guys were like, oh, there's no more time. <laughs> and so, you know, obviously some have been voted in since then. But I, I would, that's just what I want to leave you with. This is like, just, just think about how you're treating please, people. Please finish up, man. I am, I am. Just, just think about how you're treating people. And if it takes slowing down a little bit and, and self-reflection or whatever, I mean, isn't it worth it? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi again. My name is Amanda Jo Sharp. I live in the first ward. Um, Okay, I'm a little nervous. Today I wanted to talk about racism once again. This is my third time coming and I feel like 
I'm getting a little less emotional, so hopefully I can get through this without crying. Um, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I'm here to show up and speak up for the black and brown people who live in our community. It's been interesting to watch our nation react to the Black Lives Matter movement, but it's been even more interesting to watch it in my own community. While I'm not an expert on racism, I would like to share with you how being anti-racist and how to support people in your community because I'm simply still not seeing it. Simply stating I am not racist while racism goes unchecked all around you is not enough. Robert J. Patterson, a professor of African American studies, defines anti-racism anti -racism, as the following. Anti-racism is an active and cautious effort sorry, to work against the multidimensional aspects of racism. Being not racist does not require any action in the dismantling of the system of racism. Being anti-racism does. Being anti-racist is a daily choice and requires real work within ourselves, our friends, family, community, and our institutions. It's standing up daily and saying, no, that's not welcome here. Your racism is not okay. It's admitting when being or seeing something racist and then challenging those racist ideas. Unfortunately, I can speak with experience that being anti-racist is real work. I am ashamed to say that I grew up thinking racism wasn't a problem anymore because that's what I was taught and told by schools and my parents. I didn't even notice it happening all around me because of my white privilege. My white privilege allowed me to ignore racism happening in front of my eyes. Once I grew old enough, old enough to educate myself, I realized that racism was embedded in my life and how I benefited from it. Sure, I wasn't being blatant, blatantly racist, but I wasn't stopping it from happening all around me, which is still being racist. But this isn't about me, it's about all of us. Racism is rooted in our daily lives and culture and it is always happening. If you think you're not racist or haven't done anything racist or that racism doesn't live in your life and your community, you're wrong. It's something that black and brown people don't get the luxury to shrug off and ignore. Black and brown people have to wake up and deal with it every damn day. And they are pushed to the side and silenced when speaking out against racism and their hurtful experiences with it. I have seen it happening here all by the white community ignores it and doesn't do anything to act to fix it. Just today, I had a coworker tell me I don't even care enough about them to spell check their name. We're talking about two black females we were working with that had different names than his own. The coworker was confused and shocked when I called out his racism and told me that he didn't see it that way. We simply told him, no, not here. We took the necessary steps to get management involved, but the words have been said and the damage to my coworkers of color have been done. To some, it may not seem like a big deal, but it just adds to the trauma that black and brown people have already built up from being treated this way, and worse, for the past 400 years. I can honestly say, I'm still learning how to be a better ally and how to be a better anti-racist, but I invite you to do the same. I must forewarn you that others may call you radical, but wear that title with pride. White people must look inside themselves to unlearn racism and fight daily to make our communities better and safer for black and brown people. As racism scholar and author Ibram X. Kendi said, one is neither racist or anti-racist. There is no room for neutrality and there's no such thing as non-racist. He also said the only way to undo racism is to constantly identify and describe it and then dismantle it. I implore you to stand up against racism and say, no, not here. Every day, someone's life may be depending on it. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone? Okay. Dennis Platt from the Sixth Ward. Um, just real quick, I guess I wanted to follow up a bit on what a couple of the speakers talked about regarding SROs. Um, it's pretty clear that there are some pretty disturbed children attending schools and having issues at different times. Nobody disagrees with that. It, and it's not something you can close your eyes and it's just going to go away. But clearly having police in the, off, in the schools hasn't resolved mental illness. Clearly it hasn't uh, resolved uh, disputes at home. It hasn't resolved... Uh, the trauma that a lot of these kids have been exposed to. You're using a hammer on things that, that don't require being hit. 
You need finer instruments. You need to be more thoughtful about how you use those instruments. And you know this. I'm not saying anything new. And all this points to a, a lot of the services that are in this community that you don't necessarily have control over. You don't necessarily have a lot of control over mental health funding or a lot of other things. But I don't know that we're doing the job we can do as a community by ignoring those community needs. The governor is not going to come out of Des Moines and give you $7 million to resolve the mental health problems in our community. So you've got to find another way. But it's not going away by itself. And uh, the county's involved in this, and the state's involved in this, and the federal government's involved in this, and it's all on your shoulders. You have to make this happen. Uh, another comment I wanted to, to uh, bring up is just the idea of COVID, and it's not going away anytime soon anyway. Even if we have vaccinations, we're going to have to... to uh, be very thoughtful about COVID for a long time until it's gone. I mean, gone. And that's probably going to mean that meeting rooms like this need to have the air exchanging more rapidly than what it is now. Typically, I think rooms like this exchange the air about every 10 minutes, six times an hour. And the CDC is talking about um, maybe that needs to be 10 times an hour or 12 times an hour. And I don't know where you're at. Who does this? You contract it to a, a contractor, I'm sure. But it's probably something that this room needs to be looked at. Over in the police department, they have public meeting rooms that need to be looked at. You might have other areas that you want taken care of where the public is and where you have crowds. I don't know, but, uh, but I don't know that your air exchange system that you had three years ago and 10 years ago is gonna be very helpful six months from now or a year from now. So maybe you can turn it up or maybe you can ask your contractor to take a look at things and give you a bid, I don't know. That's all I have, thank you very much. Thank you, anyone else? Hearing and seeing no one. Okay, is there anything else, Ms. Spiegel? Very good, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion, Ambrose. Second, yeah. Peacock. So you. All in favor? Yeah. Aye. Very good. We're adjourned. Thank you.